this morning? Our Father, you called us and saved us in order to make us like your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Day by day, change us by the work of your Holy Spirit, so that we may grow more like him in all that we think and say and do. To his glory. Amen. October 23rd after the service. I think that's the first one that I can make it to as the church clerk. That's good. <laughs> yeah. Sister will thank you. Yes. <laughs> um, there will be a memorial service for Nancy Dayton next Sunday um, here at the church at 2. And also next Sunday there's a trustees meeting after the service. Do we have any other announcements? Linda? Yeah, I have two. Uh, first of all, if any of you would like to see a movie um, we saw on Thursday called Run the Bases, it's a very Christian movie. It's wonderful. Take your tissues. <laughs> it, is, it is such a good movie. Um, so I would encourage you to see that it's called Run the Bases. Second thing is, uh, with Life Action coming, I have a few more meals need help with. So if you are able, um, willing, have the time, uh, would you see me after church and we'll talk about what you can do to help participate with meeting those kids. Uh, there's 31 coming. So so um, we'll talk about sharing with uh, someone else or doing the whole meal yourself. And so see me after the service. Anyone else? <laughs> uh, this Friday, there will be a few of us gathering together at Big Boy over in Brooklyn uh, to talk about membership. So if you are interested in church membership, let me know if you'd like to join us. This does not, just if you go to the meeting, it's an opportunity to learn more about how to become members, what it means to be a member here. It doesn't obligate anyone to actually become a member. Uh, so if you're interested, let me know. And as Linda was mentioning about light action. I'm pretty sure now we got the housing situated, but we're still in need of two more vehicles to loan to the team while they're here. So if you have an extra vehicle, or if you have keys to a neighbor's vehicle that they forgot they gave you, that would help too. <laughs> or if you think, you know, uh, me and my, my spouse, we can get by on one vehicle during this time, and you have a second vehicle, would you let me know? Because we're supposed to let them know this week, have everything kind of together. And th those are our two needs. We've got two vehicles left and then a few meals that Linda mentioned. So we're hoping to kind of tie this all up this week. So if you're able to, pull us aside after the service, me or Linda, and that would be a great help. So thank you. No other announcements? Yeah, I don't trust those, all those little hands going up. So if mom has her hand up, we'll, we'll yeah, yeah. So as so we speak about life action, we get ready for it. Uh, we're showing a video each Sunday as we get pre to prepare our hearts. Uh, and this one is, this video is a testimonial of a couple who attended a life action conference event uh, a few years ago. And then after that, I'm going to invite up Terry Taylor, who's going to lead us in prayer as we prepare our hearts. Hi, I'm Shane Black, and I have the privilege of serving with the Life Action. 
As a ministry, we travel across the country and share the transforming good Sorry, news of the gospel. It heals hearts and changes lives. Lives like Lane and Sherry Gordon. When Life Action came to their church, their marriage was broken. On the outside, they appeared to be the perfect family. But underneath, they were selfish and hard-hearted, ignoring God and on the brink of marital disaster. But a transformational work was about to take place in Lane and Sherry as God began to reveal to them their own sin and their need for Him. We're in a meeting on the second Sunday. And they ask um, a question, what is God doing in your lives? And I'm about to have a, a coronary arrest over there because I'm so badly wanting to just let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, and just tell everybody, just get it out there, what's going on. So I raised my hand and uh, he said, what's going on? I said, if God doesn't do something in our marriage, it's over. I'm one big fake. Our marriage is a fake. We've been wearing masks for years. Uh, I'm tired of it. God must do, do a work and I'm not real sure if it's gonna happen at this point. And that's when the grace of God came in, I think. For the first time in my life, humbled myself and got real. The grace of God came in. Shortly after that meeting, I went to the guy that was teaching the family, uh, knocked on his trailer door and said, brother, my marriage is nowhere near what you're teaching and uh, I need help. During that time, God brought healing to Lane and Sherry's marriage as they repented and began fully depending on him. And we came back together at Reconcile and uh, sought forgiveness. It was like suddenly what seemed unachievable was just happening. We, did, we weren't even trying to make that marriage thing happen, but when we were both growing in the Lord and sharing in that together, it was like all of a sudden we had this thing where we just liked each other and we liked hanging out together again. God has grown us every day. My wife, the one I hated so badly, is my favorite person in the whole world. The person that I'd rather spend time with than any person on the face of earth. God did a miracle, and it was all because of a ministry that called Life Action. Terry, do you want to come and lead us in prayer? Father, we come before you this morning. We're all in need of a better relationship with you. And that's where it starts. Lord, you tell us that if we draw near to you, you will draw near to us. And Father, you tell us that you are the good shepherd. And that as if we are your sheep, we hear your voice and we follow you. And Father, these are all your words that tell us that we need to draw close to you to be in intimate relationship with you. Lord, you are all about relationships. And as this video shows how we can become hardened and how we can just, we can subdue the spirit. We can remove his influences by not listening to him. Father, help us through this conference, all of us here, that that will, even through the preparation that we got for this coming month, that we will start to draw near to you, that we will start to seek you that you will become the Lord of our every part of our lives and that we will see a transformation as that couple saw. That's only you can do, Father. You can do so many remarkable things that we will allow you to do it and allow your spirit to move through us. So I pray, Lord, that we will continue to, to seek you, to draw near to you, to pray to you, to reveal to us what is holding us back so that we can become a church that will truly be a bright light in this community to shed forth your love, your grace, and your redemption. Amen. Well, prayer is the greatest thing we can do to get ourselves ready for the conference, and that's why in your bulletins, we had this last week, I have it this week in case you weren't here or you lost yours, we have a prayer guide, prayer calendar, so that every day, <coughs> excuse me, 
We could be praying together, getting ready for the service. Uh, also, in two, two weeks, two Sundays from now, on the 23rd, we're going to have a prayer meeting here at the church at 6 o'clock, and we'd love to have you join us. That's a, that'll be the week before they arrive. And we have these prayer cards that Megan Shaw created for us. And what I hope you can do, we'll pass them out to everyone. Just stick it in your pocket and keep it in your pocket this week. You can put it in different, change it, you change your pants, put it in new pants, that's fine. <laughs> Pull them out throughout the day and read. There's a Bible verse on one side and a prayer on the other side and, and just pray. And Lorelai and Madeline, would you guys mind coming up and just passing one of these out to everybody? Thank you very much. All right, we'll turn it back over to Emily. And while they do that, I'll read the um, opening for our responsive reading today, which is Psalm 54. This is an individual lay layman asking, as many laymans do, for God's help against those who threaten the lives of the faithful. The title connects the song to the events of 1 Samuel 23, 19, where the, the Vikings, among whom David was hiding, informed Saul of where David was, promising to hand David over to him. The psalm directs its singers to God's protection and is therefore well suited for the pious to use when they are under threat of deadly persecution. For those who do not face such persecution, this psalm is appropriate to sing on behalf of their brethren in danger. So if you'll join with me in your pew Bibles. Psalm 54 on page 891. Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your might. Hear my prayer, O God. Listen to the words of my mouth. Strangers are attacking me. Ruthless men seek my life. Men without regard for God. Surely God is my help. The Lord is the one who sustains me. Let evil recoil on those who slander me, and your faithfulness destroy them. I will sacrifice a free will offering to you. I will praise your name, Lord, for it is good. For he has delivered me from all my troubles, and my eyes have looked in triumph on my foes. Say now if you'll stand for the next hymn. <coughs>
join together in prayer. Father, we can be so thankful that we live in a country and in a time where the sort of persecutions that David writes about here in Psalm 40, Psalm 54, excuse me, are few and far between. But it doesn't mean that they can't happen. It doesn't mean that it doesn't happen in another part of the world because we know that they do, that our brothers and sisters really do have to uh, take a stand for their faith. And not just from social persecution, but from violence as well. So, Father, on behalf, we cry out for them. As you instruct us here in Psalm 54, we cry out to say that you would save them by your holy name, that you would vindicate them by your might. We're so thankful that you hear our prayers, Father, that we as your children can call on you anytime we want. Father, we pray that whenever, whatever hardship we face, if we do face persecution for standing up for our faith, we pray, as verse 4 says, that we would call on you to be our help, that you would be the one to sustain us through, and that because we know that we are vindicated by you, that we are loved by you, we don't have to worry about what the opinions, about the opinions of others. We don't have to worry about even persecution because we know that blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. So, Father, help us to be strong when those, when those things happen. Father, we know that when we go through those things, ultimately, Father, you will be glorified. And so we pray that you would help us to be strong and that by standing up for our faith, it may cause us to love you and praise you and to be more devoted to you now than ever. And we certainly pray that for ourselves. And again, we pray that for our brothers and sisters across the globe. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, at this time, if the children want to come forward for the children's message.
Matthew verse chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Do not store up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy. What does that mean, moth and rust destroy? You know, moth, does that mean when they say moth? Moth can eat holes in your clothes. You can't store up clothes on. They don't last forever. Or rust, like metal things. Money and stuff, it gets, can get rusty and it breaks. Or where thieves break in and steal. Our stuff can be stolen, right? But store up yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So we talked about the physical things that we can't take to heaven with us. What are some things we can? George. Yeah. Obeying God. That's a very good one. We can do what he, he asks us to do here on earth. Yes, ma'am. Same thing, yeah. Following Jesus' word and what Jesus said. What are some other things we can do? Maybe helping others? No. Yeah. That's, what, that's something we can do. <coughs> Giving ourselves. How about telling our friends about Jesus? Because yeah. not everybody knows about him. Yes, Miss Megan. Praying, that's a very good one. And if not, we pray for ourselves when we've done something wrong, or a family member or friend when they're sick, or just praying for people who don't know about God. George, are you listening? <laughs> just praying for people who don't know God, about God so they can find out about Him. Mm. Are my trolls that distracting? <laughs> so, what this Bible verse is saying. As much as we, do any of you guys want to take this back? Do I feel like you guys are, I'll just go on. You can take it downstairs if you want. Okay. So what the Bible verse is saying is that as much as we love all of our pretty clothes and our jewelry and all the stuff, these physical things we have on earth, like when I was a kid, I loved trolls, they can't go to heaven. So we can't put our faith yeah. in this type of stuff. But we can in our love for each other, in our love for God. Right? That's something that can always stay with us. Okay? Okay, guys, let's say it again. Lord, I pray that you watch over these children and that you bless them and their families. I pray that they never lose sight of you and what you would have us do, which is spreading your love and your light to others. That we store up our, store up our treasures in heaven for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, at this time, children are dismissed for children's church. <laughs> Well, as we go to prayer this morning, praying for others. In the back of your bulletin, we have a few prayer requests already there. Find my pencil. How else can we be praying this morning? What prayer requests do you have in your hearts for yourself, a loved one, or to praise or thanksgiving? Tasha? Um, prayers for Ryan Boone. Um, he's my friend Brooke's father. Yep. He's recently been diagnosed with cancer. And he has been very poor health to begin with. Um, so prayers for him. And prayers, I have a feeling that his life is not going to be much longer. Okay. I don't think he believes in God. Okay. 
So, and I, I repeat all this for those who are online as well. So prayers for your friend Brooks' father, Brian, who uh, struggled with cancer, and you suspect his life is going to be cut short here, and you don't know where he stands with the Lord, and that is something I would absolutely to pray about. So thank you very much. Other prayer requests? Oh, Sasha has another one. Okay. Yeah, Sasha. My, my boss also made a comment about being an atheist, and that has really, like, stuck in my head. So just pray for it for him. I, I don't know. It's like pe- God's putting people in your life maybe to share God's word with. So I would like you to pay attention to our sermon today, okay? Okay. All right. It might be just for you, all right? Very good. Other prayer requests today? Karen or Karen? We'll do Jewel first and then Sue. Oh, my friend of mine is fantastic. Um, she's been struggling with cancer several years. Is your cousin, cousin Bonnie? Bonnie's fantastic. Yeah, struggling with cancer. Um, yeah, she um, needs our prayer. She is a Christian. And uh, after the Hillsdale Hospital, she can't go home on time. Um, since her last surgery, she can't put weight on her feet, you know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jewel. Sue? Yeah, a friend and co-worker, Aubrey, is having surgery tomorrow. Okay. Sue's friend, Aubrey, is having surgery tomorrow. And pray things go well. That's right. Any other prayer requests? Tammy? Sure, it's getting that new surgery on my left eye went well, and the right eye is successful. Tam, I'm glad yeah, to hear. Good, that's good. <laughs> the good thing in a surgery. You want it steady, right? So uh, prayer, thank, thanksgiving that everything went well for Tammy's surgery. Karen? Um, I want to thank you for our prayer last week for <clears throat> my granddaughter who presented me with my first great-grandson great. on Monday, last Monday. And he's healthy, and so I appreciate your prayer. Congratulations, that is Thank wonderful. You. Do you know when you get to see the baby? Uh, hopefully this coming weekend there they'll come down. All right. Lots of pictures, lots of pictures. Yeah, I've got to yeah. get my hands on it. That's right. <laughs> Any other prayer requests today? Luann? Um, my half-sister Jolene signed her up for hospice care yesterday. Um, it's just not the end necessarily. Yep. Yeah, a lot of people don't know it's not like immediate that you can receive hospice care and, and help. Yeah, that's right. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Well, let's join together in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, it's wonderful to come before you and to bring our request where we lay them at your feet, knowing that you can do all things, that you know what's best, and we trust in your love for us and your wisdom. Father, we pray for... Um, Those who are either having surgery or who have had surgery, we pray for Aubrey that things will go well for hers tomorrow. We're thankful that Tammy's went well, and we pray that she has her next surgery in her other eye, that that would go well uh, next week, too. Father, we also want to pray for um, those who are coming towards the end of life, Uh, even if it's shorter or or we're not sure when, like is. We pray for Joanne that she's going into hospice care, that she will receive this care. We're thankful it's not... uh, Her life is not an immediate threat, but we're thankful that hospice offers such services to help those those folks in need. Father, we also want to pray, as uh, Stacia mentioned, for her friend Brooke's father. And Father, we pray more than than just, obviously, his physical condition. We pray most about his spiritual condition, Father. We pray that in this, as his time draws uh, closer to the end, he would realize his own mortality and his need for you. And Father, we pray that his heart would change, and I pray, I don't know if, if it would be Brooke or another person or even Stacia, uh, you would have the opportunity to share the gospel with him. And I press pray for Stacia. She thinks about the people in her life and uh, opportunities come up and talk about faith that she and all of us would take those opportunities, be it in our workplaces or with family. Father, help us to take, a lot of times you are the one who creates these opportunities for us, and spark something in them to ask about something about faith or bring up something about God. Help us to seize those and see them as uh, opportunities given by you for us to uh, 
share our faith and to share about you. Father, we also want to pray for our shut-ins. We think of Jim and Joyce, Marilyn and Glenn. We love them, Father. They are such an important part of our church. You know, they can't be here with us, so we pray a special blessing on them. You watch over them and keep them in your peace and comfort. We're thankful that Bernie's surgery went well on Friday. We continue to pray for him as he um, continues to go and see doctors and, and get scanned and all the sorts of things that we go through. And we just pray for you to continue to keep his spirit up. Father, we pray for Young Life of Lenawee County. We're thankful for their wonderful work that they do on behalf of, of uh, teens here in not just Addison, but also in several uh schools in Lenawee County and including Adrian College as well. We pray for them as they get this a kind of transition year uh, since Jim and Bridget took off and we just pray that the, the momentum would not wane but that they continue to see wonderful uh, works at your hands working through these children and working through these teens uh, drawing them to yourself. And Father we continue to pray for our summit conference. We're so excited to to have that happen, we pray for opportunities to invite friends and neighbors to join us. And I know we're going to send out postcards to those around the lake. We pray that you would bring others in to join us, that we might hear from you, and that you would do an amazing work as we gather together to seek your face for that week. At this time, Father, we quiet our hearts to bring to you any other prayers in the silence of our hearts that you might have. Want us to pray to you, be it a request or a thanksgiving, a praise, or even confession. So hear now the prayers of your people. Father, we rejoice with Karen as she tells us about this beautiful new baby that's coming to the world, her first great-grandchild. We're thankful that uh, the baby is well and, and mom and dad are well, too. And we look forward, forward to seeing pictures when Karen has a chance to actually hold the baby in her arms. And we just bless, we give you, we ask that you bless this child and their families. They go through, obviously, a time of transition um, with, with a new baby in the house. And Father, now as we come to the reading of your word and the sermon, I pray that it be by your great power that you would um, bring your word to your people today. Father, take the mediocre work that I have done and transform it so that our hearts and minds could understand, could see, and could desire you more and more because of this. We pray all this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Well, at this time, we'll continue our worship through the giving of our tithes and offerings. I could have my ushers come forward to receive those this morning.
Father, this morning we pray as your Son, Jesus Christ, taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As we continue through our series in Acts, we come to Acts chapter 9. We're going to look at verses 19 through 31 today. Here is God's word for us. For some days he, speaking of Saul, was with the disciples at Damascus. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus is, uh, G, excuse me, immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying he is the Son of God. And all who heard him were amazed and said, is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem of those who called upon this name? And has he not come here for this purpose, to bring them bound before the chief priests? But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. They were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he attempted to join the disciples. And they were all afraid of him, for they did not believe that he was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord who spoke to him. And how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists, that is the Jewish uh, Greek Jews. But they were seeking to kill him. And when the brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea and Samaria, uh, excuse me, all Judea and Galilee and Samaria had peace as well, and was being built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it, that is the church, multiplied. Why is God's word for us this morning? At my last church out in Boston, we had to have an intervention for uh, a couple in our church. The mom was having an emotional uh, relationship with another man, if, it, if not physical, I think it was probably physical. And she had also began to use recreational uh, drugs with this man. And so we had an intervention where the family and close friends came to really confront her about the way she was living her life and to call her to a changed life. And we told her exactly what this changed life would look like. This wasn't a, you know, like we, some pie in the sky sort of things. Here's what your changed life needs to look like. You gotta leave this man now. You gotta cut off all communication Social media, everything. Got to cut it all off now. Nothing. And then, the husband would like you to take a drug test every week. And we're not sure how long it's going to last. But every week, you got to have a clean drug test. And third, you got to be more attentive to your family. It's not fair to the kids. Now, unfortunately, none of that happened. There was no signs of a changed life. So the goal of the intervention failed. But last week, we looked at a different intervention. We looked at a divine intervention. And that was Jesus himself appearing on the road to Damascus in front of Saul. Now, as we remember Saul's former life, he was a man who was zealous as a young Jewish religious uh, student who was growing up in the faith and is becoming a leader in the eyes of these re new re of the religious leaders. And he had taken it upon himself to persecute Christians, to persecute this new Jesus movement, which he thought was absolutely blasphemous. And so he was helping round them up as far as 130 some miles away to Damascus, where he was going on this mission. And that is when 
Jesus intervened. He had Saul experienced a divine intervention. And because of this, Saul became blind. He had to wait in Damascus, not knowing what was going to happen next, not knowing if he was going to regain his sight ever. And God sent one of his disciples, Ananias, to go to him to pray for him, to lay his hands on him, that he might regain his sight. And we ended last week's passage with these verses. Then he, Saul, rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. So Saul had this amazing intervention. And the question is, will it change his life? Now, obviously, we got a good start because it tells us he was baptized. That's a good sign, all right? But that's a one-time event. It's going to happen a week from now. It's going to happen two weeks from now. Is he going to continue in his old ways? Is he going to go back to those old ways? Or are we going to see changes in his life that show us his life has truly been changed by this intervention? So today we're going to look at, in our passage, five ways, five changes that occurred in Saul's life, all, all as a result of his conversion. So last week, when we looked at his conversion, we looked at kind of five things that God did to bring salvation into Saul's life. Now, we're going to look at five ways, five things that Saul, that Saul himself did to kind of work out this salvation and to put these new changes into his life. So the first change is that his life was now centered on Christ. You can kind of say his life was centered on Christ before, to persecute Christians and to be opposed to Jesus, but now his life is completely centered on following Jesus Christ. Verses 19 through 20. For some days he was, he was with the disciples at Damascus, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. Again, at my old church, there was a young man who was giving his testimony before he was going to be baptized. And he had a lot of good things to say, but it was interesting. All the things he said were really about him, about the changes that he made, the things that he had done in his life, the good things. And God actually wasn't mentioned that much in the testimony. It was really all about him. It was kind of centered on himself and not centered on God or even on Christ. Not so for Saul. As we read here in verse 20, and immediately he proclaimed Jesus. He didn't proclaim Saul. He didn't say, look at how what amazing thing happened to me. No, I want to proclaim Jesus. He is the Son of God. That is a strong indication of a life change. A life that is no longer centered so much on me, but centered on Christ. Now, this is one of the reasons why, as a pastor and most pastors, they hound their people. Hey, are you praying every day? You're reading your Bible every day. You're taking time to be with the Lord every day. Because when you do that, especially if you do it in the morning, what does that do? It helps focus your day. It helps to focus your mind less on all the things that are going to happen, all the things that you're worried about, all the things that are planned out. It helps you to focus on Jesus again. Focus on Christ. Well, that's the first major change we see in the life of Saul. His life was centered on Christ because of this intervention. Second, we second change was Paul was not only empowered, but as Paul, he will eventually be called Paul, but he's Saul right now. But I might say that a few times because it's I know who he's going to become, right? So Saul is empowered, and because of that, he is bold as well. He is not afraid to share his faith. Verse 22 tells us that Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that Jesus was the Christ. He wasn't lifting weights. All right? That's not what he, the strength he's talking about. He's talking about spiritual strength and stamina. And then a few verses down in 27, we read this. But Barnabas took him, Saul, and brought him to the apostles, declared to them how on the road he had seen the Lord, spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. Now, as I mentioned before, remember who Saul was before he became a Christian. He was this young man who was rising through the ranks in the religious circles very fast. He was educated and he was respected. It would have been an easy temptation for Saul after this intervention to be like, okay, I was wrong, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I'm just not going to tell everybody about 
I don't want to let everyone, I'm going to keep my new faith kind of secret, keep it on the down low. He could have felt embarrassed, ashamed, feel like he was letting others down who had, uh, you know, done so much for him in his life. His, his former teachers, his former bosses, his family. He could have easily allowed their approval to keep him from speaking out, from being bold. And we see some of the opinions that we talk about here in verse 21. Here are some of these opinions. Is not this the man who made havoc in Jerusalem and who call, of those who called upon his name? And has he not come here for this purpose to bring them bound before the chief priests? Let me translate for you. What happened to this guy? What is going on with him? So instead of being shy, his encounter with Jesus so impacted him that he could not not talk about Jesus. His encounter with Jesus and also being strengthened by God's spirit allowed him to be bold and not to be concerned so much about the opinions of others. The question is, what about us? Are we bold in our faith or do we hide in our shells like scared turtles when the subject of faith or Jesus comes up? Because like Saul, we are empowered by God's spirit too. The question is, will we act on that power or will we suppress it in our lives? So that was the second major change. He was not only empowered, but he was bold. He stepped out in his faith. A third change in his life. Saul now partnered with other Christians. He partnered with them. Verse 19. For some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. And 26 through 28. And when he had come to Jerusalem, he had tempted to join the disciples. The first thing he wanted to do was join with the disciples. But of course, they were all afraid of him because they didn't believe he was a disciple. They thought, they thought this was a ruse. Like, oh sure, yeah, you're a disciple. You just want to get in and find out, start taking names down who all are disciples and come round us up. I don't think so. But of course, we keep reading, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles and declared to them on the road how he, Saul, had seen the Lord, who spoke to him, and how at Damascus he had preached boldly in the name of Jesus. So Saul, because of that, went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. It could have been real tempting for Saul, having experienced this miracle intervention, this first-hand encounter with Jesus, that he could have just been like, I'm just going to go off and do my own thing. Well, why in the world do I need other disciples? Why do I need the church? I mean, besides the apostles, have any of these other new Christians that they had an experience like I have? No, of course not. But Saul realized the importance of partnering up with other Christians. Because you see, at this point, they knew a lot more than he did about Jesus and his life and his teachings. He, as a, uh, a faithful Jewish kid rising through the, the, the ranks here, he knew the Old Testament, but they showed him how Jesus was the key to the Old Testament. So partnering up was helpful to him, of course, because think of the impact that his transformed life must have had on all the others as well. God's amazing grace, as he tells us about his testimony, um, the fact that anyone can be saved, he could be saved, anyone can be saved. Saul's example of just surrendering his life and boldness, that would have been an encouragement for the disciples too. See, friends, we too are not meant to go alone. God has given us a spiritual family for us to encourage and to bless and to be encouraged and blessed by as well. And this is true in our passage today. Saul encouraged others uh, through his boldness, but Saul was also encouraged specifically by Barnabas who stepped in and took a chance on him. You know, as we just read, you know, they, everyone thought this was a ruse. No one believed that this was, he was really a disciple. And so they were all giving him the cold shoulder, like, oh yeah, we meet at so-and-so at such a time. It probably wasn't that place. You know, we don't want him anywhere near us. But Barnabas took a chance. Took him to the apostle, saying, listen, I know his testimony. I know I've heard what he's done. This is real. Uh, Rick Warren, in his book, The Purpose Driven Life, has this to say about the fact that uh, we need the church. He says, You are called to belong, not just believe. Even in the perfect, sinless environment of Eden, God said it is not good for the man to be alone. We are created for community. We are fashioned for fellowship, 
We are formed for a family, and none of us can fulfill God's purposes by ourselves. The Bible knows nothing of solitary saints or spiritual hermits, isolated from other believers and deprived of fellowship. The Bible says we are put together, joined together, built together, members together, heirs together, fitted together, and held together, and will be caught up together. You're not on your own anymore. While your relationship to Christ is personal, God never intends it to be private. In God's family, you are connected to every other believer, and we will belong to each other for eternity. The Bible says, In Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Following Christ includes belonging, not just believing. We are members of his body, the church. End quote. Unfortunately, even among Christians today, church is thought of as optional, not worth prioritizing. Yeah, we'll attend church when it fits into our schedule. I really hope that's not said of our people. Saul makes it clear that no matter who we are, we need to partner with other Christians. And that was a change he made in his life and prioritized it too. A fourth change. He was on mission with a new mission. Now, of course, he had an old mission, and that was to destroy this new Jesus movement. But after his encounter with Jesus, his mission was to proclaim and preach about Jesus. <clears throat> Verse 20. And immediately he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogue, saying, He is the Son of God. And verse 28. So he went in and out among them at Jerusalem, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. And he spoke and disputed with, uh, excuse me, against the Hellenists. He wanted to tell others about Jesus. He wanted them to know about God's amazing love and forgiveness. He wanted them to experience what he had experienced as well. Now you might think to yourself, you know, that's great for Saul. I can't imagine doing that myself. I know God wants me to. I know he's supposed to do. I know it's like a duty I'm supposed to do. But man, I just don't know. Now it's true. This is, is a duty we're supposed to do. But I don't think duty is what motivated Saul. He wasn't doing it because he had to do it. Saul was doing it because he wanted to do it. In fact, I don't think any of us have trouble speaking to others about people in our lives who have changed us, who have been an influence on us. I mean, I can tell you a lot about our former pastor, John Reist. He had a huge influence on my life, and not just my life, but my ministry as well. I could tell you lots of stories, and those of you who know him know there are lots of stories to be told, all right? I have no fear of talking talk about him. He had that of being this major influence on my life, and it should be no different for us when it comes to Jesus. If he has had a major influence on our lives, we should want to talk about that. The question really is, has he really had a major influence on your life? He certainly did for Saul, and that led him to be on mission for Jesus. And as verse 20 tells us, this was an immediate mission for him. Which reminds us, you don't have to be a Christian for a long time. You don't have to sit in Sunday school for years before you can start telling people about Jesus. In fact, it makes sense that if you've had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, if you've been so greatly influenced by him, that you wouldn't wait to tell others. You would want to start telling others right away. I can tell you this summer when the doctor saved Kim's life with the birth complications, I was immediately singing their praises, telling family and friends, getting on Facebook and just saying, what a great job the medical professionals did at Hillsdale Hospital to save Kim's life. And that was a change that Saul had. He was on mission with a new mission and wasn't afraid to tell others. One final change that we see in his life, and that was this. Saul was able to endure suffering. And my goodness, he suffered right off the bat. Look at this. Verse 23. When many days had passed, the Jews plotted to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul, and they were watching the gates day and night in order to kill him. But disciples took him by night, led him down through an opening in the wall, lowering him in a basket. And then, I mean, that would be bad enough. Okay, what happens a couple of verses later? And he spoke and disputed against the Hellenists in verse 29. But they were seeking to kill him. A whole separate group of people, all right? He's not good at making friends. And when the <laughs> brothers learned this, they brought him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. He just becomes a Christian, and twice, twice, there's a plot to kill him. 
Now, we talked earlier about being concerned with other people's opinions, but what about being concerned with other people's violence towards you, all right? That might make a brand new baby Christian reevaluate their allegiance to their newfound faith. But this was not the case for Saul. It didn't slow him down at all. And we asked, well, how in the world? It would slow me down and people trying to kill me for my faith. How was that? How was he able to endure hardship? Well, it's because of all these other changes he made in his life. The fact that his life was now centered on Christ. He had been empowered by God. He was partnering with other Christians. He had a new mission to follow. These fundamental changes in his life allowed him to be able to endure hardship, suffering, and not wilt or quit. In fact, these truths were how all the Christians of Saul's day were able to endure hardship. Because if you recall, the great persecution that Saul himself helped start back in chapter 8, verse 1, where we, where we read, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. They were all scattered. They had to leave their homes. They had to flee throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And here at the end of our passage in chapter 9, we get the first summation, the first summary verse of how the church is doing since this persecution broke out. And we read this in verse 31. So the church throughout all Judea and Galilee, by the way, not just Judea and Samaria, but now we're up to Galilee, had peace and was being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, it multiplied. The church was in the midst of severe persecution, yet we are told they weren't cowering in fear, but they were experiencing peace. They were being built up and multiplying. How? Well, they were walking in the fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit because they had centered their life on Christ. They had been empowered and strengthened by God's Spirit. They stuck together as a church, and they had not forsaken their new calling, their new mission and purpose to tell others about Jesus and what he has done in their lives. Friends, these are the same truths that are available to us as well today. These are the same truths that will see us through our hardships and give us the power to know Jesus and make him known to others. And these are the truths that should accompany a changed life as a Christian question is, does your life match up with these truths? And if not, what will you do so that your life does? Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we recognize that a changed life is a partnership between you and ourselves. That, Father, you are the one who does the work of salvation in us. But, Father, you call us to work out that salvation. And we see this in the life of Saul. You are the one who called him and converted him at the road of Damascus, and yet Saul's the one who had to work out the faith to make it real in his life. And we see these fundamental changes that, that he put into place. Father, we pray that you would do the same for us. Perhaps we have experienced some of these changes in the past, but we kind of got away from them. Father, may this today, this sermon, this message, be you calling us back to yourself, calling us to go back to these these truths that we know will sustain and keep us strong in the faith. Father, that we might be centered on you, that we might be empowered and bold in our faith, that we might make it a priority to partner with other Christians here in the church. Father, that we would be on mission with the new mission that you've given us. And we know that if we are doing these four things, no matter what happens, what's thrown our way, we'll be able to endure hardship with a deep-seated joy and steadfastness that cannot be shaken. Father, we thank you. Do these things, we pray, through your Spirit. May we respond faithfully. In Jesus' name, amen. Our final hymn this morning speaks about this changed life, what it looks like, what it means. It's called Living for Jesus. It is number 372. If you're able to, please stand for our final hymn, 372, Living for Jesus.
Chinese 